story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. I'm going to begin by reading a poem which will introduce the whole series of Bible studies. It goes like this. Yes, I thought I knew my Bible, reading piecemeal, hit or miss. Now a part of John or Matthew, then a bit of Genesis. Certain chapters of Isaiah, certain Psalms, the 23rd, 1st of Proverbs, 12th of Romans. Yes, I thought I knew the Word, but I found that thorough reading was a different thing to do. And the way was unfamiliar when I read my Bible through. You who like to play at Bible, dip and dabble here and there, just before you kneel a weary, yawning through a hurried prayer. You who treat this crown of writings as you treat no other book, just a paragraph disjointed, just a crude, impatient look. Try a worthier procedure. Try a broad and steady view. You will kneel in awesome wonder when you read the Bible through. Well, what this series is trying to do is to help you to read the Bible a book at a time because God gave us this library of books. It's not one book, it's 66. And it's a library and each book has its own message and everything in that book relates to the message of the book. Now, most people who resolve to read the Bible through get stuck in the third book called Leviticus. And I can understand why. There are at least three reasons why it is a very difficult book to read. The first is it's boring. It's like trying to read the telephone directory through. You might f find the name of someone you know sooner or later, but it's boring because it's so different in content from other books of the Bible, especially from the first two. The first two are full of stories, full of narrative. There's a plot, there's drama, things are moving. And then suddenly when you get into Leviticus, there is hardly any narrative at all. And since we regard the Bible as a book of stories, and then we come across a book that has no stories, it kind of throws us off balance and we get a bit bored because there's no story. Second reason is because it's so unfamiliar. It's not only boring, it's unfamiliar. It's a different culture as well as a different content. We're moving 2,000 years or 3,000 years away and 2,000 miles away and it's a totally different world. And we read about things that we're just not familiar with. For example, the way they deal with infectious disease in Leviticus. A poor person has to tear their clothes and let their hair grow long and not brush it and cover the lower part of the face and go around shouting unclean, unclean. Well, that's not how we deal with infectious diseases in our society. It's so unfamiliar, it's so different and a lot of it is rather weird, even bizarre. You didn't have to go to church last Sunday carrying a little lamb or a pigeon and give the pastor uh, the poor creature who would then slit its throat in front of the crowd. If you do that, you have to have red carpets rather than blue carpets in your church, but it's just so unfamiliar. It's just so different from anything we're used to. And thirdly, it seems to be irrelevant. Not just boring and unfamiliar, but irrelevant. What has that got to say to me living in 1993? What has it got to say to me on Monday morning? at work. It just seems irrelevant. And somehow deep down we know instinctively that we are not under the law of Moses. And this is part of his law. So what's it got to do with us? Well, I hope that by the end of the, this talk and the next, you're really excited about the book, book of Leviticus. It's one of five books that together make up what's called the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five. The five books, the first five books in your Bible, the law of Moses. The Jews call it Torah, the books of instruction. And they read it through once a year. They start on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, sometimes September, October, and they start with Genesis 1 then, and they read it through the year. 
and finish the next Feast of Tabernacles the following autumn. Now let's just look through the five books of Moses and see the shape of them because there's a distinct shape to these five books which you may never have seen before. See these two lines narrowing down. Just keep that shape in your mind and let's run through the five books. Genesis is the book of beginnings, it's what the word means and it tells you how everything began from our universe to the people of God Israel. Exodus, same as the word exit, the going out from Egypt. Leviticus derives its name from the tribe of Levites, one of the tribes of Israel. Then the book of Numbers is precisely what it says, it's a book of statistics. 600,000 men came out of Egypt, plus women and children, probably two and a quarter million. Then Deuteronomy, Deutero means second and nomos means law, so the name Deuteronomy means second law because in fact God gave them his law twice, once at Sinai and once just before they crossed the Jordan into the promised land. That's why the Ten Commandments come twice in the first five books of the Bible, once in Exodus, once in Deuteronomy, the second time. So they had a kind of reminder of the law just before they went into the promised land. Now when we ask who are these books about, we begin to see this shape emerging because Genesis is a universal book, it's about everybody, it's about the human race, it's about the whole universe, it's a universal book. As soon as you get to Exodus you're into a book that zooms down on one people, one nation, Israel, so it is a national book. When you turn to Leviticus, only one tribe out of the nation. See how it's narrowed down from universal through national to tribal. But as soon as you get past Leviticus, it opens out again. And the book of Numbers is about the whole nation again. And the book of Deuteronomy puts Israel against the backcloth of the entire world among the nations and you're back to a universal viewpoint. So you've got a zoom lens that's going in and out as you go through the books. And maybe that's a reason why people get stuck in Leviticus because uh, while they're interested in universal things and even national things, when it gets tribal, it begins to leave us behind. But it opens out again, so by the time you get to Deuteronomy you're interested again. Now the next way it does this is when you ask the question where and look at it in space and you find it begins with the whole earth, begins to focus in on Chaldea, Ur of the Chaldees where Abraham lived, then the land of Canaan to which he came, then the land of Egypt where they became slaves for 300 years but it focuses in, in Leviticus, only on one place, Mount Sinai. So once again, the zoom lens is focused in on one place, Sinai, and then out it goes again. The journey is through the Negev, Edom and Moab, back into Canaan. But it's narrowed down to one tribe in one little place. And even more, when you ask the question when, once again there's this very same shape to the whole five books. Genesis covers centuries all the past history of our earth. Exodus covers years, about 300. Leviticus only covers one month and then Numbers covers 40 years and Deuteronomy looks forward through the centuries to the future history of Israel. So can you see the shape of the five books of Moses? And do you realise therefore that Leviticus is the hinge of the whole thing? That we're focusing down to the most important month at the most important place and the most important tribe in the whole thing. And that's why it's so very important. The whole of the law of Moses hangs on this. So they read through this every two, 12 months, uh, which means that they spend about a fortnight to three weeks reading Leviticus every year. And we're going to read it as a Jew would read it before a few minutes have passed. I just want to relate Leviticus back to Exodus to show you how these books follow on from each other. 
very important to see how each book grows out of the previous book. So how does Leviticus build on Exodus? In the second half of Exodus, the tabernacle is built, God's tent in which he lives among his people. And if you imagine the camp in Exodus, you see God's tent in the middle and hundreds of other tents all around it. There's the divine tent and the human tents. The book of Leviticus is about everything that goes on in God's tent and everything that should go on in the people's tents. Divides into two halves, God's tent, the people's tents. It is the rules and regulations for both. There's more to it than that. The book of Exodus in the tabernacle talks about God's approach to men, but Leviticus talks about man's approach to God. The book of Exodus is about the deliverance that God brought to his people, but the book of Leviticus is about the dedication of God's people to him. So the book of Exodus is about God's grace in setting them free, but the book of Leviticus begins with thank offerings, how the people can show their gratitude for being set free. And therefore we need both halves, may not be as exciting as Exodus, but God expects something from us in return for what he's done for us. That's how it fits in them. We are saved in order to serve. And Exodus talks about how God saved his people but Leviticus about how they are to serve him. We're not just saved from, we're saved for. Now when we read the Old Testament, I find it a very good idea to read it as if I was Jewish. I'm not, I wish I was. This nose runs in the Porson family, <laughs> but it helps me when I go to Israel. But I'm not Jewish, I wish I was. But let's try and imagine we are Jewish and let's read this book as a Jew reads it once a year. Why would he? We shall see that it's a matter of life and death to a Jew to read this book and to know it and even more to live it. You see, there is only one God and that's the God of Israel. There's no other God at all. All the others are figments of human imagination. There is only one God. He is the only God there is and they were his only people on earth. And therefore there was a special relationship between them. And on God's side he promised to do so many things for them. He promised to be their government, to be their minister of defence and protect them, to be their minister of finance and see there would be no poor among them, to be their minister of health and to see that none of the diseases of Egypt touched them, to be everything they needed. He was going to be that to them, their king. In return, he expected them to live right and to do things right or to be righteous. That's what righteousness means, to live right. And the key text in the whole of Leviticus is one that keeps popping up in the New Testament. Be holy for I am holy. In other words, God expects the people he liberates to be like him and not to be like everybody else around them. And if you're puzzled by some of the things that appear in Leviticus, that's the key that unlocks it. When God tells them you mustn't do this, he's saying that's because the people around you do that and you're to be different. You're to be holy because I'm holy. <coughs> You're to reflect my character and let people see what I am like by what you are like. Now that text is the key, be holy for I am holy. You'll find it more than once and you'll find it all over the New Testament as well because it still applies. If God saves you, he expects you to be like him. He expects you to live his way and to be holy as he is holy. Now then, let's look at the general shape of the whole book. I told you the book was in two halves and once again, I'm sorry you're having difficulty seeing, once again this shape comes in but now the shape is in the book itself 
and the book builds up to a climax and then flows from a climax. It is in fact a multi-layer sandwich, a kind of McDonald's burger. <laughs> and there's something right in the middle and then there's a bit and you will see straight away from the colouring of this chart that the first section corresponds to the last and the second to the second last, the third to the third last, leaving one right in the middle. And there's a clear correspondence, beautifully put together, beautifully worked out. Remember that God is responsible for this pattern, not Moses. Did you realise that there's more of the Word of God in Leviticus than any other book in the Bible? About 90% of the book of Leviticus is the direct speech of God. The Lord said to Moses, there is no other book in the Bible that has so much of God's direct speech. So if you want to read God's Word, this is a jolly good book to start with because you're reading the actual words of God. And so God put this together and you can see a beautiful harmony and a pattern in it. So the offerings and sacrifices of the first seven chapters are backed up by the sanctions and vows of the people in the last section. The priesthood in great detail corresponds to the worship that they are to lead and how the worship of the people is to be led. But here are the two main distinctions which people of God have to learn and I'm going to come back to that in a moment because it's very important to find out the difference between clean and unclean and between common and holy. Those are not the same things as we shall see and uh, that's going to be another key. But the whole thing builds up to one day called the Day of Atonement. That's a day on which they had to take two animals and they had to sacrifice one animal inside the camp and the other and what a key this is, the other animal, a goat. They would put their hands on its head one after another, confess their sins and then push the goat out of the camp into the wilderness where it would die with all their sins loaded on it. It's the scapegoat. And that's a word I read in my daily newspaper only this morning. It's a word that came into our language from Leviticus, the scapegoat, the one who gets all the blame, the one who carries all the wrongs of others away and we'll come back to that. Now this shape here divides the book into two leading up to this day and coming from this day and from a Christian point of view, I won't say much about this now but we'll look at it more later, the first half describes our way to God, what we call justification in the trade. And the second half, the second half, they're horrible long words, aren't they? The second half describes our walk with God, what's called sanctification in the trade. Now that gives you the shape of the book. Can you get the feel of it now? Once you get the shape of a whole book, it's much easier to read it because you know where you are and you know what part of the plot you're touching. Now, having looked at the whole book, I want to look at one or two items in it and we'll start with those first seven chapters, the offerings. There are five, running very quickly through them, the burnt offering, you brought an animal and you burnt the whole thing and you let God smell it. The whole thing was given to God and God loves the smell of roast mutton. And it was a sweet-smelling savour to him, you were offering the whole thing to him. But the meal offering, you kept part of it for yourself and you had a meal with God and God had a bit of it and you had the other bit. It was a meal offering or a peace offering. You've got all the details in Leviticus. But I want you to notice that the first three offerings were the right way to say thank you to God for a blessing. They were not offerings for sin, they were thank offerings. In other words, do you feel grateful to God? Then this is how He wants you to say thank you. I'm speaking now to Jews, you see. And this is how you can express your gratitude to Him. Are you glad that you're alive? Are you grateful for your health? Are you grateful for your money? 
then show your gratitude this way. And they could choose one of those three ways, just to say thank you to God. The other two offerings were not to express gratitude, but to deal with guilt. There was the sin offering and the trespass offering. And these did two things. Well, first of all, they made atonement for sin. They offered God compensation for what you'd done wrong. The word atonement doesn't mean at one moment. That's a modern idea. It doesn't mean that at all. It means to compensate. So if you atone for something, you offer something as compensation. And these are both compensation offerings to God and they involve blood, they involve life. As a compensation to God for the bad life you've lived, you offer a good life that has not sinned. But one of the most important things in these two offerings I want you to notice, and uh, if you've read through Leviticus you must have been struck by this, they only work for unintentional sins. They do not work for deliberate sins. In other words, nobody's perfect, we all make mistakes, we fall into sin unintentionally. Didn't intend to do wrong, but we did it. Now God provided offerings for unintentional sin, but there isn't an offering in this list for deliberate sin. That's very important because that is picked up in the New Testament as we shall see. The New Testament distinguishes between accidental sin in Christians and deliberate willful sin in Christians. And the New Testament, like the Old, says that if we deliberately sin after being forgiven, there is no more sacrifice for sin. Did you ever notice that in the New Testament? That comes straight out of Leviticus. Deliberate sin in those who have been forgiven is very serious, which is why Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. This distinction runs right through the New Testament as through the Old between deliberate sin in God's people and accidental sin in God's people. And for accidental sin there is full provision made because God knows we're weak, He knows we fall, He knows we don't intend to. The evil I would not, that I do, says Paul. That's unintentional, accidental and that's covered. Well now those are the offerings. I'm not going to say much about the priests because it's all very straightforward. I'd like to go straight through to the fact that they had a calendar to observe. Now in the New Testament we don't. There is no Christian calendar in the New Testament. Surprise, surprise, there's nothing about observing Christmas or Easter. But for the Jewish people a calendar was a vital part of their walk with God. They were being treated as children. Adults don't need a calendar. Children do to remind them of things that they would forget. And all these feasts are mentioned in the book of Leviticus and have to be kept. Let's run through them very quickly. Forget the left hand of the board for a moment, just look at the red words. It began in the first month of the year, which is roughly our March, April, with Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th of the first month to remember how God brought them out of slavery in Egypt. And on the day before the Passover, a lamb had to be killed at three o'clock in the afternoon. Isn't this amazing? Three o'clock in the afternoon, in the midst of the afternoon, it says, kill the lamb. And then the following day begins Passover. Three days later, they had to offer the first fruits of the harvest to God. Three days later. Does that strike a chord? The first fruits of them that sleep? Fifty days later, there's the word penti again, five or fifty, Pentecost. 50 days they had to hold the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks because that was the day that the law was given on Sinai and they had to remember that and give thanks for it. 
But do you know what happened when the law was given at Sinai on the very first Pentecost? It says they sinned and many were put to death. Do you know how many? 3,000. So that when the law was given on the first Pentecost, 3,000 perished. Centuries later, when the Spirit was given at Pentecost, 3,000 get saved. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how the whole Bible holds together? Those were the feasts at the beginning of the year. Then we come to the feasts at the end of the year. Feast of Trumpets, the old ram's horn shofar was blown. <laughs> Trumpets. That signaled a whole new round of feasts. The second of which was the Day of Atonement. That was that crucial day when the scapegoat was pushed out of the camp with all the sins on it. Followed by the Feast of Tabernacles, eight days. The Feast of Sukkot or Booths, when they moved out of their houses and lived in shelters, they had to be able to see the stars through the roof to remind them of their 40 years foolish wandering in the wilderness when they could have been in the Promised Land in 11 days. So that group of three feasts came towards the end of the year. Now all these feasts will be fulfilled in a Christian way. The first three have already been fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus, which is already passed to us. But these three will be fulfilled at his second coming. I don't know the year that Jesus will get back, but I do know the month. It'll be September, October for sure because he always does things on time. So one of these years, September, October, Jesus will be back. You know he was born then, don't you? He wasn't born December 25th. The evidence in Luke's Gospel points to the seventh month of the year, which is tabernacles. This is when they expect the Messiah. And interestingly enough, every time a trumpet is mentioned in the New Testament, it's to announce his coming. So these three feasts, are over, they're fulfilled in Christ's first coming, but these three will be fulfilled at his second and on that day of atonement redemption will come to the whole nation of Israel. Now there are two more, there is a weekly rest and for slaves in Egypt who'd worked seven days a week, what a blessing a weekly rest must have been. There is no trace of the Sabbath in the Bible before Moses. Adam didn't have a Sabbath, he worked seven days a week. Abraham didn't have a Sabbath, he worked seven days a week. But with Moses was introduced this weekly day of rest. It was not to be a holiday or a family day, it was a day for God, a holy day. And that was part of their calendar. These were annual, this was weekly, and this was every 50 years. And what a jubilee it was! Every 50 years, everybody's bank balance was leveled up. Wouldn't you like that here? <laughs> you look a little uncertain, some of you. I can tell from your faces whether you've got a big bank balance or a little one. But you see, all the property was reverted to the family that originally owned it every 50th year so that the leases got cheaper as you got nearer the 50th year because they were shorter and slaves were set free on the 50th year. All sorts of lovely things happened. So people looked forward to the Jubilee, to the acceptable year of the Lord, when there was good news for the poor because they'd be rich again, when the captives would be set at liberty. Now does that strike a chord with you? Jesus proclaimed the Spirit of the Lord is on me to set at liberty the captive and good news for the poor to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, Jesus began the real jubilee to which every one of these had been looking forward. See how important it is to know the Old Testament, to understand the new. Now we come to this very important but difficult question of the difference between holy and common and clean and unclean. You see, the world always thinks in terms of good and bad. They only have two categories of thinking, whereas the Bible works with three. 
And we first encounter this in Leviticus. And if you don't master this, you won't master Leviticus. This is terribly, terribly important. A thing may be clean, but is still common. Now, there are two processes going on. One is when sacred, godly, holy things are profaned and become common. You can spoil a holy thing by making it common. I'll give you an example. Do you know what sparked off the Romanian Revolution a few years back? It was sparked off by a Christian pastor. He went out and bought a toilet roll, took it home, and when he first used it in the lavatory at home, he realized he was using pages of a Bible. The Bible Society had sent Bibles into Romania in the communist era and the communist government made a big thing of it. It was a kind of publicity stunt for them. We have Bibles here and they were used to manufacture toilet rolls. And when that pastor realized he was using the Bible for a toilet roll, he was so angry that he preached a sermon that sparked off the Romanian Revolution. Now, it wasn't that the Bible had been made unclean because there's nothing unclean about the toilet. It had made a holy thing common. It had profaned something. Do you see? The next stage down is to take a common clean thing and make it unclean and make it sinful. The three words sacred, secular and sinful correspond roughly to this thinking of holy, clean and common and unclean. Now, just as there is a process of profaning the holy to make it common and polluting the common and clean to make it unclean, there is a process of redeeming this situation. You can cleanse the unclean and make it clean and then you consecrate it and it becomes holy. The thing is, in the Bible, what is holy and what is unclean must never come into contact. They must be kept rigidly apart. Things holy and things unclean have nothing in common. And it is also mentioned in the Bible that a mixture of unclean and clean will make both unclean. But isn't that true? If you mix dirty things and clean things, do the clean things make the dirty things clean or do the dirty things make the clean things dirty? You know. And I'm quoting Nehemiah there, he said exactly that. Similarly, if you mix holy and common things, that makes it all common, doesn't make it all holy. Now, are you with me? This process here, uh, that arrow should be pointing down, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. That arrow should be pointing down. This downward process leads to death, quite literally, whereas this other process leads to life, but it involves sacrifice. Only by sacrifice can you cleanse what is unclean and bring it to life. By the way, how many of you are in full-time Christian service? Could I see? I said, how many of you are in full-time Christian service? Could I see? Now, you see what I mean? You see, work, work can be any of these three things. There are some jobs that are illegal and immoral and are unclean. A Christian couldn't be in them. There are other jobs that are clean, but common. Now, I don't mean that you've got to be a missionary or a pastor before you're holy. It depends on whether you consecrate your work to God and you can be a holy taxi driver. You can consecrate your work and do it for the Lord and then it ceases to be common. It becomes a holy vocation in the Lord, do you see? You can be a missionary and you can be here. You beginning to see something? Your money can be unclean if it's spent on bad things or clean if it's spent on good things or holy if it's consecrated to the Lord. Sex can be any one of these three things. Are you beginning to grasp the importance of this threefold distinction? You see, there are plenty of people out there in the world who are living decent, common, clean lives, but they're not holy people. And God just doesn't want us to be living good lives. He wants us to be living holy lives. That's the emphasis in Leviticus. My people, if they get into unclean, they must be cleansed and brought into clean condition, but then they need to be holy people because I am holy. 
And that's different from being good people. And that's the answer to those outside the church who say, I can be as good as anybody inside church. I can live as good a life as you do who go to church. But they're not holy. They never use the word holy. They wouldn't dream of using it because they don't understand it. They don't know about it. They just say, well, he lives a good life and he's not a Christian. He may live a good life, but that's not being a holy people. And God isn't just after good people. He wants a holy people. And we're going to see in the book of Leviticus what that involves, to be a holy people for the Lord. It involves all kinds of very practical things. When I read Leviticus, it astonished me how practical it all is. Let's, let's take health. You see, we're looking now at holiness of life, which means wholeness of life. It means there's no part of your life that can't be holy. Let's look at health. The body is just as important to holiness as your spirit. And that's why Leviticus talks about haircuts, as does Paul in 1 Corinthians. That's why Leviticus talks about tattoos. Did you know the Bible said anything about tattoos? Talks about men wearing earrings, or shouldn't be. Very interesting. This is all holiness to the Lord. It's as practical as that. It does talk about bodily discharges, both male and female, and childbirth. There's an awful lot about food here, about clean and unclean food. And, uh, you know, they, they've made an awful lot of kosher food in Jewish circles. They've built it all on one text, thou shalt not boil a kid in its mother's milk. So they now have two kitchens, two lots of pots and pans for dairy and meat products. That's not what the verse means at all. They've built a whole religion on it almost. I enjoy telling them that Abraham was non-kosher. He gave veal and butter to the four angels who visited him. <laughs> Naughty Abraham! Actually, you see, that boiling a kid in its mother's milk was a fertility rite of the Canaanites. And God said, you don't do it because they do it. You're holy to me and you don't get involved in that kind of superstition. There are things in Leviticus about not getting involved in occultism or with spiritist mediums. There's quite a bit about dry rot in the house. And you're not to call the rent kill man in, you're to burn the house down because you love your neighbour. If you love your neighbour, you'll burn your house down if you've got dry rot. Aren't you glad you're not under the old covenant? And then clothes. No mixed material, no mixture of wool and polypropylene or whatever. And it's um, a Jewish family, Marks and Sparks, that helps me to break the law of Moses regularly. Social life is covered. It says holiness means paying special attention to the poor, the deaf, the blind and the aged. It says if you're a holy person, you'll stand up when an older person comes into the room. This is holiness. Very practical, isn't it? Covers the whole of life. The very text, you shall love the neighbour as yourself, comes straight out of Leviticus. That's part of holiness. Covers all of life. It says incest is down here. There's a great increase in that. It says homosexuality is down here. It says buggery is down here, which cuts out Madonna's latest book. All these things are very down to earth. What is a holy life? It's how you behave from Monday to Saturday and not just what you do on a Sunday. And it's every part of your life, your clothes, your house, your food, your clothes. It's concerned with all of life. That's what holiness is. And we learn this from Leviticus. But once you've grasped this clear distinction, you've got the key to unlock Leviticus. God is looking not just for clean people, but for holy people. That's a big difference. And until you become a Christian, you never even think of becoming holy. You just think of being good. And that's not good enough. Well, we'll continue in the next talk.